Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Please get cozy as we jump right into these Bigfoot and paranormal encounters. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe and ding that notification bell. I post new videos every single day and you'll be notified when they go live. Okay, let's get into it. I managed to run into Bigfoot when I was out camping one night. The only issue is that all of my pictures that seemed clear at the time became so blurry that nothing I had as evidence was reputable. Instead, I'm going to journal what happened to me that day. This way, I will never forget the details behind what happened, and I will never stop trying to tell everybody I know what I really saw that day. Lake Monroe Park in Florida is far from one of the wildest places where I've gone hiking or camping. I had barely been in places where bears or alligators were ever even a potential threat. I figured this would be the same thing and I would spend the day and night in nature before returning to my boring life. It was also not one of the more secluded places with a ton of people walking around and even riding their bikes along paths and trails. I have read a lot of places where Bigfoot had been located, but almost all of those were isolated or wilder. I really do enjoy nature, but not all of the other people that had the same idea as me. I wanted to be alone, and not hearing talking or music or anything else people were doing in the park. I managed to find an area that nobody seemed to be at that was only slightly off the hiking path. I could see a rope bridge nearby, and I was going to use that as a waypoint to make sure I didn't wander off too far. As long as I could see the bridge, I knew that I could find my way back to the path and out of the park. I didn't bring much with me, and wanted to just have an as authentic an experience as I could. Sleeping under the stars and enjoying the sounds of nature. This area was great, because while Florida is hot, there is plenty of shade around, which also means plenty of things that can hide in the shadows. The noises around me seemed odd, and I was hearing branches breaking. I never heard that in my lifetime of camping. So, I went to try and see what could be making those sounds. I saw a tree branch snapped in half like it was just a twig. I figured that maybe it happened in some kind of storm or on impact from the ground. When I saw more of them, I knew something off was going on around me. It was starting to get a little dark, but I could see where I was and I was too curious to just turn back. I heard more snapping of branches as I got closer, and they got louder. Finally, I saw one being broken in front of my very eyes by a creature in the shadows. We have some wild things in Florida, but the one thing I wasn't expecting to see was Bigfoot himself. Not much scares me, but I almost peed in my pants at the sight of him breaking another branch apart. I knew that I had to take a picture and slowly pulled out my camera to try and capture it. I managed to get a picture, but didn't realize the flash was on and it got his attention really quickly. I ducked behind a bush and he didn't see me, but knew something was going on. I wanted to get a better look at him because I still saw him in the darker shade. He started to walk towards me, and I held my breath, but still tried to keep my eyes on him. I couldn't make out any details, but with my camera flash being on, I knew that I must have caught something. Him walking felt like the ground was shaking, when he eventually passed me by and kept walking by. I felt safe enough to take a look at my camera, and I saw the picture I had was blurry. I knew that it was Bigfoot, but nobody else was going to see him. It looked like a shadow instead of a solid creature standing there. I needed a better one, and slowly, 
walked in the direction I saw him going. It was by pure luck that when I made it back to where I started, he was just walking across the bridge. I made sure the flash was off this time and took a few photos of him before he made it across and back into the shade of the tree. Looking at these pictures, I noticed something strange about them. When I took them, he was clearly in the frame and visible. Looking at them after were all either blurry or had light making it impossible to see anything. I was starting to wonder if something about him messed with the cameras. I crossed the bridge myself, trying to find him, or maybe even the area that he messed. I wanted more than just a few messed up photos. Nobody would trust. He was big, and I knew that he would be pretty easy to spot because of that. Instead, it was like he evaporated or teleported right out of the forest. I spent an hour walking around looking for him, again only to find that it was as if he was never there. I know what I saw, and I never want to forget the details of how it happened. Some people believed me, and others claimed that I must have been seeing things while or was dehydrated and hallucinating. I don't try and fight with people that don't believe me because I know that people who want to believe he is a myth will say anything is fake. For those that believe me, I want to let them know that maybe they are searching for him in the wrong place and the parks in Florida might have a clue they are missing. On to the next one. Back in the 1980s, my lifelong friend Alex and I shared a bond akin to brothers. Our childhood in rural Pennsylvania was marked by countless adventures, especially since we grew up in an era before the ubiquity of cell phones and digital cameras. Those were simpler times, when a camera was bulky, special occasion gadget. Not a daily carry item. This detail is crucial because whenever I recount the eerie events that unfolded in our youth, people inevitably ask why we didn't capture any of it on film. But in those days, film was a precious commodity and you never knew if your shot would turn out clear or not. Our tale begins in our teenage years, a period when our lives started taking different paths. The woods behind our houses once our playground saw us less as we got engrossed in the typical teenage preoccupation of cars and dating. However, for Alex's 19th birthday, we decided to revisit our childhood haunt, the mysterious woods and the enigmatic caves in the nearby town of Millville, a place that had always sparked our imagination. The caves, known among the locals as the Whispering Caverns, were part of the Blue Ridge Mountain Park's sprawling landscape. Our earlier visits as children, under the watchful eyes of our parents, had only given us a glimpse of their potential for adventure. But now, armed with the independence that comes with age and a car, my trusty old Ford Pinto, we planned a weekend of exploration free from parental oversight. We packed our supplies, some food, a couple of flashlights, and a hearty dose of teenage bravado, and set off towards the caves. These caverns were steeped in folklore, with tales dating back to the late 1800s. Local legends had it that a hermit named Jonathan Clark once made these caves his home, giving them their mystique and ominous name. The story went that Clark, an eccentric loner, had ventured here from the distant Appalachians and spent his final years in the labyrinthine depths of these caverns. The motel where we checked in was a modest establishment about a half hour's drive from the caves. It was the kind of place that would be the perfect setting for a spine-chilling horror story. Isolated, run down, and seemingly forgotten by time. Our room was at the very end of a row of identical units, bordered by a thick, foreboding forest that seemed to whisper secrets in the wind. From the outset, 
there was an air of unease about the place. It might have been the way the trees swayed under the moonlight, or the way the motel's neon sign flickered intermittently, casting eerie shadows. Despite the chill that ran down our spines, we settled in, planning to start our adventure early the next morning. However, the first night at the motel turned out to be anything but restful. Stepping outside for a cigarette, a habit we picked up in a rebellious phase, we were immediately struck by the profound silence of the night, broken only by the distant hooting of an owl. But then, an unsettling noise cut through the stillness, a high-pitched, keening sound that seemed to come from the depth of the woods. It was unlike anything we had heard before, a chilling blend of a wail and a screech that made the hairs on the back of our necks stand up. As we stood there, frozen, the light of the motel flickered and dimmed, casting long shadows that danced across the ground. We hurried back inside, bolting the door behind us. Despite the alcohol coursing through our veins, sleep eluded us, as strange scratching and whispering sounds seemed to echo around the room. The next day, trying to shake off the unease from the night before, we set out for the caverns. The whispering caverns were more than just a geological wonder. They were a maze of legends and unexplained mysteries. We were determined to explore the parts of the caves that were off the beaten path, the sections that were not meant for tourists' eyes. Our journey through the caves was an exercise in both awe and fear. The formations within were breathtaking, with stalactites and stalagmites creating an otherworldly landscape. But as we ventured deeper away from the marked path, the air grew colder and the oppressive silence of the underground pressed in on us. It was in one of the more remote caverns that we first heard it a sound that chilled us to our bones. It was the same keening wail we heard the night before, only now it was accompanied by a sense of something ancient and malevolent lurking just beyond the reach of our flashlight. We tried to convince ourselves it was just the wind or some animal, but deep down we knew it was neither. Panic took hold as the sounds seemed to close in on us, echoing off the cave walls. We scrambled backward toward the entrance, the noises following us growing louder and more frenzied. It wasn't until we emerged into the night air, gasping for breath, that the sounds abruptly ceased. But the respite was short-lived as we made our way back to the car. The forest around us seemed to come alive with whispers and rustling, as if the trees themselves were speaking in hushed tones conspiratorial tones. Our flashlights cast long, menacing shadows as we hurried along the path, every snapping twig and rustled leaf sending jolts of fear through our body. It was then, in the clearing by the car, that we saw it, the source of our terror. A creature, humanoid but grotesquely distorted, stood at the edge of the lights cast by my headlights. Its skin was pale and stretched tight over its bony frame. Its limbs long and twisted, but it was the hand that, that truly horrified us, elongated and ending in sharp, rake-like claws. The creature moved toward us, its movement jerky and unnatural, as a cacophony of whispered filled the air around us. Its eyes, small and black, seemed to bore into our very souls. In that moment, we understood that we were in the presence of something utterly inhuman, a creature of nightmares made flesh. Without a word, I turned the key in the ignition, and we sped away from the creature and the whispering caverns, leaving behind a mystery that would haunt us for years to come. In the years that followed, I would learn of the legend of the rake a creature of folklore that seemed to match the horror we had encountered. But knowing its name did little to ease the memory of that night. 
a night when the shadows of the Blue Ridge Mountains revealed a terror beyond our wildest imagining. On to the next one. I am very excited to announce that on this channel we are offering membership. Now, I never want my subscribers to feel like I am paywalling content, so new videos will remain 100% completely free. The membership is a way for those who feel like they want to support me to do so and help the channel grow monetarily. What your membership gives you access, though, to are subscriber badges, which evolve with how long you've been a member, and you can watch your badge grow from a baby Bigfoot all the way up to a sage Bigfoot. Also, as a member, you'll get access to member-only emojis, which are these beautiful Bigfoot emojis. Again, I never want to paywall any content on this channel. I always want the content to be free because I love the community and I want you to enjoy your time here. But if you do wish to support me making this content, this membership is a way for you to do that. Thanks for listening, and on to the next one. This was in Sheridan County in Wyoming. Myself and two friends went into the forest with our slingshot to find some squirrels. We had been coming to this place for years, every September for our church retreat. The elk were just starting to come up into rut, and we could hear them bugling up on the higher plateaus as we were hiking in. We were about a mile or so in, northwest of the lodge. There was a barbed wire fence cutting through the wood here, and on either side of it, for about 10 to 15 yards, the trees were younger, ranging from 4 to 8 feet tall. It was apparently cleared for the making of the fence, and we decided it would be easier to walk alongside the fence for a while. We went another few hundred yards, and as we rounded a bend, my friend stopped suddenly. I was following, and so I stopped as well. I thought maybe we had walked up on something. My friend turned and looked at me and whispered, Do you see that? I couldn't see as there was a small pine in my way. I started to ease forward, and as the tree moved out of my view, I just froze at what I saw. At first, I thought it was a large bear, but discounted that idea immediately. It was like a massive human-like animal covered in a dark, coarse-looking hair. Like a black bear, but not as thick in all areas. The face, chest, inside elbow area, and hands were nearly bare. It was around eight feet tall, and I would say it weighed between 450 to 550 pounds. It had shoulders that were extremely wide, and they sort of slumped forward. Its arms were phenomenally long and thick. They hung far below the thigh area, and the hands weren't as large, but still very big. They were more thick than long. The buttocks were unproportionately large. They didn't seem to fit the animal. They, too, were very muscular looking. The head of the animal seemed to be plopped right onto the shoulders. If the thing had a neck, it wasn't any more than three to four inches long. The face was something like a man's and somewhat like a gorilla. We were about 15 to 20 yards from it. It stood there, seemingly observing us as we crouched there, observing it. This went on for at least two minutes, and it took a small step to the left and forward, partially blocking our view of it from about the crotch down. You could hear it breathing like it had been running to get to where it was. Then my friend yelled at it, saying, Very funny, who's in the ape suit? We scolded him, telling him to shut up. I could tell it wasn't a joke. This, whatever it was, was a real animal. Then it made a noise, not really a growl, but more like a deep cough, like it was clearing its throat, but quite louder, like a coughing bark. It's really hard to describe a noise you have never heard before with words. That did it for us. 
So we turned and sprinted down the fence line, took a cut through the wood, and went straight to my parents' camper trailer. We told him what we saw, and my friends left to go tell their parents. My father knew I wasn't fibbing. I was 12 then, and I'm 28 now. He had been outfitting for nearly 20 years all over Wyoming, and since I was six, I got to go along on a lot of hunts. He knew I knew the difference between one game animal and another. We waited till morning and headed back into the place we had seen the animal the day before. We searched for two to three hours, and other than smashed grass and current bushes, we found nothing. You could see where something heavy had stood, then proceeded in the opposite direction we fled. He didn't know what to think of it, but he did believe me and my friend. He said he had heard here and there about the animals they call Bigfoot, but not in these parts, and he wasn't so sure about such an animal even existing. Even to this day, if it's brought up, he'll still say, you saw what you saw. It was 5 p.m., good light and visibility, on a clear fall day in the upper 40s. The incident took place one mile northwest from the camp. The altitude is nearly 9,000 feet, all conifer trees and very dense, a lot of windfall. You're walking on the ground as much as off of it. The camp and the siding area are in a basin about two to three miles wide. The tops of the mountains around are rocky and for the most part bare above the tree line. There is a creek running through the center of the basin called Owens Creek. On to the next one. In Lincoln County in Wyoming, my friend was from Kemmerer and was interested in showing me where he and his family had hunted virtually his entire life. We were both 21 years old, and I can honestly say in the best shape of my life. We had breakfast at his parents' house that morning and had no alcohol of any kind before arriving at the location. We arrived at the base of a mountain in the area at approximately 11 a.m. It was a beautiful day, 55 degrees and sunny. I had just purchased a new Ford truck, and we parked in a clearing about a third of the way up the side. We climbed to the top from there, arriving at the top at about 1 p.m. We walked for the rest of the day. We were purposefully being as quiet as possible the majority of the time in order to see as much wildlife as possible. We came upon elk and moose during the afternoon. We were making a large loop down the side of the mountain and back to the truck. The loop was approximately nine miles. At about 5 p.m., it became clear that we were not going to be at the truck before dark as it was getting darker by the minute. About 7.30 p.m., we were getting close and we only had to cross a small stream that was about a half a mile from the truck. By the time we crossed the stream, it was dark. The moon was rising and providing some light. What comes next, I have only told to certain family members for fear of being ridiculed. If it had not happened to me, I don't know if I would believe it either. When we crossed the stream, we were in thick brush and trees. As we came out of the brush and into the clearing, we saw the truck about 500 yards away. It was visible in the moonlight. We talked quietly about where we had been and where he and his dad would most likely concentrate on hunting. As we got closer to the truck, approximately 400 yards, I saw some movement by the truck. I could not tell what it was, but it was a brand new truck and I was concerned that someone may have been trying to break into it. My friend saw the movement at about the same time as me. We decided to be a quiet as possible and sneak up to the truck. I had an S&W 357 and my friend had a 44 Ruger. We were not afraid at the time, but we were soon to be. As we came up to about 200 yards, I could tell in the moonlight that the movement was from an upright figure. I initially thought that it was a human, but something was odd. 
I could not understand if someone was trying to get into it why they weren't being more forceful. As we came to about 75 to 100 yards, I could hear the sound of the metal of the truck being bumped up against, much as you would hear if you put your hand down on the hood or the sides of the door or something. At this time, we both knew that there was definitely someone we were going to encounter. I was a little scared coming up on someone like this. I thought if someone wanted the truck and they were also armed, what would happen? Neither one of us wanted to confront someone with a prospect of shot being fired or anyone getting hurt. We continued to slowly stalk our way up to the truck without muttering a word to each other for fear of being heard. We still continued to see movement around the truck, but we could tell there was more than one individual. When we were approximately 40 feet from the truck, I could not believe what I saw. Not two, but three creatures, two large and one smaller. The larger ones were roughly six and a half feet tall and the smaller about five feet. I could immediately tell they were not human because I could distinguish that they were covered in hair and not clothed. We were stopped dead in our track. At this point, not knowing what to do for about three seconds, they looked similar to one another. Their shoulders were wide and their necks seemed to be shorter than that of an average human, although I have seen people on occasion with similar shaped necks. I could tell that their heads were larger than average and their arms were longer than normal. All three were muscular, but in a compact way, not at all like an Olympic athlete. At this time, everything happened so fast. They all three saw us at about the same time and bolted away from us. It was too dark to distinguish facial features, even in the moonlight, but I could tell one of the larger ones was looking right at us just before they all ran. When they ran, we ran towards the truck. Although they all three ran in the same direction, the two larger ones ran slightly away from directly toward the rising moon. I estimate it was about 30 degrees above the horizon. The clearing was large, and I could clearly see the smaller one that was running almost directly toward the moon. When this happened, I could see the individual very clearly. I have always thought of the creatures as individuals because they did not behave in the way that normal wild animals would. They were so curious around the truck, not like anything I had ever seen before or since. They meant no harm to us or even the truck. The smaller one that I saw at the closest distance was on a dead run. The gate was upright and almost leaning back. I have seen large football players almost have this same type of running position. The body was totally covered in thick hair. I could tell the color was dark brown, not totally black. Before I knew it, I was fumbling with my keys trying to get into the truck. At this moment, I was really in disbelief and nervous but not scared. As soon as I got my door open and opened the other side, I started up the truck. My friend said the first words we had spoken to each other since we were just into the clearing. He said, we can't tell anyone about this. I didn't say anything. I had the truck coming down the side of the hill as fast as I could. He was always scared of my driving, but did not say another word until we got to the bottom. We have not seen each other in about 10 years now. We tried to tell one other person we worked with about two years after the incident. This person was from Wyoming and did not believe us. I am an honest person and I cannot stand liars of any sort. I really did not want to even post this incident, but my family persuaded me. They know my character and I know that I definitely believed what I have told them. I did not hear the creatures make any vocal sound themselves. The only sound they made was their feet hitting the ground and the dry grass swishing when they were running. This incident occurred at 8 p.m. The sky was clear, the temperature between 45 and 50 degrees. 
It was dark, but there was good moonlight in the direction the three individuals were moving. It was in a clearing about one third up a small mountain. On to the next one. We had planned a family camp out near Olive Lake in Oregon. I worked at the time with a fellow who raved about this area and had been there several times himself, so we planned a week, packing up everything we would need for this little vacation in the woods. At the time, our two children, Sophia and little Eddie, who were 12 and 16 years old respectively, were in excellent physical condition both being very athletic, and so we could plan to do an extensive amount of exploration in the form of hiking. On the fourth day of our campout, we headed north into the Umatilla National Forest, with our goal for the day being the base of Desolation Butte, a 7,000-foot mountain to our northwest. We had hiked about four miles crossing over what I would say was a secondary road, with the butte now dead north of us. As we re-entered the wilderness to continue our hike, we were entering an area of the woods that was very undulating. It was an up and down and all around walk where your forward visibility was extremely limited. As far as what we could see ahead of us, for the most part, we were following some apparent game trails as well as some open areas in the trees. Now, I have to tell you before I get into what happened next, because it all unfolded so quickly that each of us was carrying a canister of bear spray. Between reading the instructions and coaching the kids in its use, I remembered that the spray had an effective range of 20 to 40 feet. And that, to be truly effective, it needed to contact the eyes and the nose. These were basically large canisters of pepper spray. Our family at the time was in what I would call quiet mode. In other words, during the hike, there were times when we were jabbering like magpies, and other times we were quiet, focusing on the task at hand and taking in the surroundings. This was one of the latter. What happened next was so frightening and had happened so quickly that, frankly, it was hard to believe. I was leading our little troop and had quite literally just stepped over a small rise in the trail we were following, which dropped down to our left. I heard a short grunt, which was followed by an enormous Sasquatch jumping out of the brush about 40 or 50 feet ahead of us. Sophia screamed, and when she did, the creature let out a loud growl. It snarled at me, showing me its teeth. My wife grabbed little Eddie as I pulled my spray canister from my belt. The beast was snarling at me with the evilest grin you could imagine. As I already had brought the canister into position to fire if it moved any closer, I said to the family to back away slowly and Susan said, we're not leaving you. All of them had their canisters out, and this was happening. My eyes had glanced down to the left side of where the creature had come from, and I could see the fresh, bloodied carcass of some type of animal lying on the ground. The beast's face around its jowls was wet with what I knew was blood. We had more than likely stumbled upon this creature as it was engaged in eating a kill, and it was none too happy about us being there. Perhaps it was just warning us off, warning us off of its kill, like most predatory creatures would. The creature was snarling and curling its lips, making quick forward movement with its upper body, in a way that seemed to be somewhat of a fake that it was about to jump or leap in our direction. I guess the best way to describe it would be that of a bluff. He looked like a prize fighter who was faking a left to throw a right, if that makes any sense. I took one slow step backward and told the others to start doing so themselves. As we did, this beast took one large, quick step toward us, 
and I pulled the trigger on the canister. The cloud came out in a torrent, but fell short of the mark and had emptied rather quickly. I then told Sophia to give me her canister. When the cloud came pouring out in the direction of the beast, it lurched backward, apparently being spooked by what had happened. Then, as quickly as it had begun, it snarled and clenched its fist, stepped back to its right to reach down to grab the animal and disappeared into the trees. We could hear some thrashing and snapping noises as it moved away, and we turned to make our own escape while the getting was good. I was taking the rear, walking with one eye over my shoulder and telling the others to try to move quickly and carefully. We reached the place where we had crossed the secondary road of which I spoke earlier. Having reached the road, we saw a solitary hiker coming in our direction, carrying a backpack and a long walking stick. So we waited for him. As he got closer, he hailed a hello to us and we started to walk towards him. Sophia was clutching my wife in such a way that I guess he could tell something was wrong. And perhaps our faces told the tale as well. He asked us if everything was all right. As I began to tell him what had happened, to be honest with you, he wasn't as stunned as I believe most people would be having heard what we just said. He said that these creatures were talked about in the region, but he had personally never had seen or experienced anything of the sort, although he knew others who said that they had. We introduced ourselves, and out of the kindness of his heart, he said he was going to accompany us back to our campground. I told him it wasn't necessary, but he was insistent and joined us for the hike back. This guy reminded me of Davy Crockett. He had a long graying beard with a big knife on his belt, as well as a compound bow lashed to his pack. When we reached the camp, we all settled in for some grub with our newfound friend, whose name was Elijah. He said that he spends weeks at a time in the woods, basically fending for himself. He also said that he had experienced and heard many strange and unusual things, including loud howls, which he could not explain. But he had never seen anything the likes of what we had. I think one of the craziest things about this encounter was how quickly and easily we had come upon this beast, with neither us nor it being aware of the other's presence until we were virtually on top of each other. It also made us realize just how quickly and, unfortunately, bare encounters can occur with virtually no time to react. If this creature hadn't been in front of us, he could have been on us in a split second. And had it been off the trail to our left or right-hand side, it could have snatched us in an instant. The creature was about eight feet tall and four feet wide, having both enormous hands and feet. It was definitely a male, for obvious reasons, and it stunk like you can't believe. In fact, just a split second before it jumped out, I had gotten a whiff of it, but it was too late. Its head was recessed into its upper body, which was massive and very muscular. The face had some hair on it, but it was very sparse and scraggly in appearance. The teeth were very stained and yellowed being mostly square in shape, with two somewhat fanged teeth protruding down from the top, similar to how a human's teeth look. To me, this was in no way a human. It simply stood on two legs and had eyes and a nose, but that's where the similarities ended. This was a large and potentially deadly animal in my opinion, and I am glad we escaped with our lives. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!